All right, we're getting ready to start. Uh, I gotta set up the live here into Facebook. Just takes a moment and we'll be getting started. Okay, I'm going live. All right, here we go. Hello, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna get started in about uh, a minute or two and just give people a chance to hop on. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to share my screen and share uh, this link around to all the groups, and then we'll get started. I'm super excited about our guest today. Uh, it's going to be a really riveting uh, conversation, and so I'm just going to go ahead and get us going. Hi everyone, so I'm Robin Donaldson. I am uh, the host of Grassroots Voices uh, with Robin, me, and friends, uh, where community and politics meet. This is episode four uh, of our uh, season, I guess you could say. Uh, so we're gonna get started in a moment. I like to start off with a few videos uh, so I can give people a chance to hop on and join us. And I can go ahead and share uh, this link around our other groups. So I'm gonna go ahead and queue up our first video and then uh, we'll be getting started um, after the videos play. And I'm super excited uh, today for our special guest, uh, Shereen Mitchell. It's gonna be a very very uh, riveting conversation. I'm super excited and happy to uh, introduce her to our community and uh, have you ask questions and get your answers um, on a lot of the disinformation and misinformation campaigns that have been happening. So again, I'm going to go ahead and start the videos and then we'll be starting uh, right after that uh, with the interview. Thanks for your patience. Okay, <laughs> sorry, it's just me here. So I'm trying to juggle everything. Okay, here we go. Docs is a new kind of doc. You don't just write with it, you create entire workflows. We are going on a family sorry about vacation. The everybody is so excited for this. Today marks 58 years since the March on Washington. That is where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his iconic I Have a Dream speech. In Atlanta today, local activists commemorated civil rights leaders like Dr. King and pushed for laws they feel will make voting more accessible to everyone. She knew her was at the rally today. 
This is very important. We have to protect our rights. This isn't just another rally for Christian Robert Scott. It's a significant one on the 58th anniversary of the March in Washington and after a historic presidential election where Georgia saw a record number of registered voters. It's important for us to get out and vote and get the right leaders in there to protect all of us. Local activists brought out other leaders and people from all over the country to join the March on for Voting Rights event Saturday in front of the King Center. These activists are pushing for Congress to pass the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act. Congresswoman Nakima Williams says everyone must be engaged in this conversation. If you weren't here during the civil rights movement, if you ever wondered what you would have done during the civil rights movement, this is your moment to find out. We are at a critical point in our nation's history, and it's up to all of us to make sure that we are stepping up. And stepping up is what everyone here is encouraging others to also do. The group marching down Auburn Avenue to the John Lewis mural honored civil rights leaders who came before them who they say acted on their words. The work always continues that even though we've made progress in our state and in our country, that progress can be taken back very quickly. The Scott family says that's why they're here and why their daughter came along to see what it means to protect your vote and to take action. My daughter, she's six. Um, she is important for her to be here. So when she, she understands she can learn from a young age what's going on now and when she grows up and she can continue. All right. Thanks for your patience. We go to our next video. My wife and I have worked hard to provide a much better life for my three. My wife and I have worked hard to provide a much better life for my three-year-old daughter, Kylie, than what I inherited. I'm the oldest of four children and proud son of two Army veterans. My mother and stepfather divorced when I was young. As hard as it was starting over, I never saw my mother give up. She worked overnight, went to school during the day, and still managed to care for four children on her own. And she succeeded. That's why I'm here today with my wife, Karen, and my daughter, Kylie, because my mother refused to give up. Her example inspired me in college as I began working in media before graduating. I found myself working overnight as a video editor, producer, and executive producer before I even earned my degree. After graduation, I traveled across the U.S. reporting and anchoring until Karen gave me a reason to move to Sandy Springs. I have built a successful business in Sandy Springs. With my public relations firm, we've worked with attorneys to fight for accountability in crimes against women and children, voting rights, and working to get leaders who are passionate about people in places to make a difference. What they won't tell you is how much I care about people and improving our community. They will tell you that I lack the experience to lead our city. But how much experience do you need to recognize that our city has failed us? From the outside, our city appears to have it all together. What it has promised us and what was produced don't match. We were promised diversity and inclusion, but we received task forces and subcommittee groups aimed to address affordable housing and transportation, but lacking the power to influence the city's own master transportation plan with their own findings. Our community is home to some of the nation's largest corporations, but many of their employees can't even afford to live here. We lack the infrastructure to ease the commute for working families, and few if any minority companies are getting a fair shake at obtaining bids with Sandy Springs, even though minorities now make up 40% of the city. These are more than just issues to me. These are the lives of the citizens of Sandy Springs. I'm running for mayor of Sandy Springs because the same old politics just doesn't work anymore. No more task force, no more dinners. We've got real work to do. This city has been a dream for developers for far too long, but we've got dreams too. Dreams of a city where our leaders are transparent. Dreams of a city where the leadership reflects the diversity of its population. Dreams of a city that is affordable for our first responders, teachers, and working families. I hope you'll join me in making our dreams a reality. My name is Dante Carter. I'm running for mayor of Sandy Springs because integrity and transparency in our city government matter. And 
This last video is our special guest, and so you'll have a little bit of a taste of what we're going to be talking about today, uh, but we're going to be talking more about COVID, but um, this is a little bit of insight into the work that Shireen does on a daily basis. Uh, this is from Now This. Doing nothing oh, might not sorry, feel guys. like something, but the truth is- you Can't avoid the ads, you know? Give it one second. So. Shireen, um, she does a lot of work in regards to the disinformation and misinformation campaigns, and this video is a few years old, uh, and we'll talk about it with her in a second. You've heard about the Russian interference in the election, how it sowed discord and division between groups, but you might not have heard that these divisions were centered on Black identity. Racism is a vulnerability in the United States that can be exploited. There were a series of online campaigns that were the testing bed for what would eventually happen in 2016. It started as early as 2013. Donglegate was a campaign targeting a Black woman who spoke up about sexism at a tech conference. few Black women created a campaign to identify fake accounts that were pretending to be Black women with the hashtag, your slip is showing. But the pattern of fake accounts pretending to be Black women had already taken hold. This tactic would later become useful in the 2016 elections to suppress the Black vote. Twitter and Facebook account, both disguised to look like they were run by the same black activists, were actually the work of Russians. When the House Intelligence Committee released the 3,500 ads from the Internet Research Agency, the overall sentiment was that it was about race. the groups targeted, African Americans received the most attention uh, by these Russian troll farms. The understanding that African Americans should be targeted to try to keep them from voting for Democrats, but also recognizing the way in which racism and racial tropes could be used to stir up uh, racial divides in the election. today, the problems we are facing with social media have yet to be solved. No matter how sophisticated the algorithms will become, the solution is within reach, and it's a human one. I don't believe it will be fixed until we focus on the victims of these attacks instead of the attackers. When people think about Black women or girls, they are standard stereotypes that are instantly believed. We will not solve this problem until we understand that. So I'm so excited for you all to meet Shireen. Uh, let me just stop share here. Okay. I'm going to change around uh, the agenda a little bit um, today uh, in order to make more time for our guest. So we, you know, we can hear from her. Um, all right. So uh, without further ado, Shireen Mitchell has been named one of Fast Company's uh, most influential women in technology. Uh, she is with us today. I met her uh, via audio, via Clubhouse, uh, the app Clubhouse, and she is a really outstanding uh, speaker and she just really stood out to me. And so I reached out to her and she was nice enough to um, come on to the show. And so in this episode, you're going to meet Shireen. Uh, she's a social analyst and diversity consultant. We're going to talk about some of the uh, disinformation, misinformation campaigns um, sponsored by Russia and other bad actors and why they're targeting Black Americans with this information and, or disinformation and how it's affecting uh, Black people as well as this country and what we can do about this. Um, 
Shireen is, like I said, one of Fast Company's most influential women in technology. She's an award-winning technological woman of color, founder, author, speaker, social entrepreneur, nonprofit leader, advocate, diversity analyst, and political, digital, and social strategist. Uh, she is a serial founder. Um, she founded Digital Sisters, uh, Sisters Inc., um, it's the first organization to focus on women and girls of color in tech and online access. She is a native New Yorker playing video games, designing BBS boards and gopher sites prior to the web going worldwide. Uh, as an early adopter, Shireen was one of the few women of color web designers in the early 90s, and she's been involved in with tech and social networks for over 30 years. So I love that you all are here and please drop um, your questions in the comments and we'll do your best to um, weave them into the conversation. But without further ado, introducing Shereen Mitchell. I'm gonna admit her here. Okay, looks like she's joining. All right, Shereen, there she is. The life of Zoom. <laughs> Hello. There we oh, go. Here we go. Hello, Shireen. Thank there you so much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to talk with you and you know share you with our community. Uh, you know, it's funny because we, we've been crossing paths on Clubhouse, uh, the app, uh, in various uh, political rooms and, and newsrooms and uh, rooms about democracy. And I've always just, you know, you've just always stood out, not just your perspective, but how you arrive to um, your perspective and the information you're sharing. And so I've, you know, been following, you know, a little bit about some of these disinformation campaigns and, and misinformation campaigns, uh, but I've just never really heard anyone speak as, you know, detailed and eloquently about them. Um, so I just was so excited that you were willing to come on and speak with us. So welcome to Grassroots Voices. Well, thank you for having me. I, I, I'm actually honored to be here as well. And, and uh, it's been one of the things I've been working on for quite some time. So it's really important to keep having these conversations. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have another uh, another path we cross. I also came from the, uh, the Blogalicious world uh, when I first started kind of getting into blogging and an online program. So when I was doing some research, because your name was like standing out to me, I didn't know, you know, why, if I had just seen it, you know, uh, like the now this video or press or something, but uh, you know, one of the videos, it said Blogalicious. And I was like, oh my gosh, another, you know, Blogalicious alum. So that was, that was a neat uh, discovery. So yeah, I had, um, I had some old days of starting some original blogs. So yeah, that is, that's amazing. Yes, yes. So let's launch in. I'm going to be doing way more listening uh, than talking, but uh, the, the groups that you're speaking with, um, the Facebook group, Stacey Abrams Grass, Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots, we started that uh, back in March of 2019 and or, or 2020. And we just kind of worked together throughout the, uh, the 2020 election cycle and the runoffs. And then we have about 15 or so other uh, Georgia-based uh, political and social justice groups that I shared this uh, the show uh, link along with. So that's that's who you're speaking with. A lot of people who do a lot of organizing in the digital space, um, especially as well as on the ground. Um, and yeah, I'd love for you to just I don't even know where to begin, but we we were definitely going to talk about these uh, campaigns, uh, this information campaigns regarding COVID and how they're. Um, you know, targeting specifically the black community. So maybe we can start there. Yeah, let's start there. Uh, and the reason why I want to start there is because it's the most recent meme and it's the thing that's happening right now. But I do want to talk about in general how these things are happening and more importantly, how come they are targeting the black community and what we can do about it. Uh, those are that's my passion, but it's also the work that we do, and I just think it's important for people to understand. So, what we did track as of August sixth, which is the earliest part of uh, this month, we're at the end, was a campaign that was basically trying to use the vaccine passports 
uh, as a weapon. And they used a meme using like Kendi's uh, quotes, uh, uh, logos from organizations like Lives Matter, Human, Human Rights Campaign, uh, Amnesty International. These are memes that were just made up. They took quotes from other things. They put, they got uh, stock images of black and brown people, plenty of, you know, mostly women, a couple of men. And that was being distributed to help participate in the, in the anti-vax and the vaccine passport uh, uh, disinformation campaigns. And, and the reason why this is important is because what, I, what we're starting to see is that the people who actually are anti-vaccine or, or participating in some of this mass mandate actually do not really care that our children or anything happening to us <laughs> matters, right? But harms to us are fine. But when they have an agenda, they have no problems using our as a way to not only weaponize that, but to put also garner some of us to be on their side on the issue. Um, once they realize there, there's a dearth of, uh, of, of diversity and, and, and there's some missing race to this debate, they typically try to find a few people to kind of make it look like, well, we're all agreeing on this particular point when if you look at the numbers majority wise, it, that is not true. The majority of the people participating in this happen to be white. Um, they care about us when, when they can support their cause. And so that's kind of why we, when we started to track the campaign was really important. But what was happening was something that we had already checked all the way back in 2013, where they were, there were these fake accounts on Twitter pretending to be black women Spreading those, spreading those memes and actually going at white people or any other person who was talking about the vaccine passports or anything about anti-vaccine, simply sharing the meme. At some point, several real people start to share the meme and we were able to get see that the um, accounts were taken down, right? So because the, they were fake accounts that were cr created literally right at August. Um, those were taken down, but the accounts where there was real people sharing the memes, those were not. So the memes were still being, and that's the part that people don't understand is that many of these disinformation campaigns start very disingenuously or inauthentically is what they're saying. And then really come up. And so then there's a conversation which I have to do with all the time. Oh, we're not the bots. No, no, no. But you were infected by them. And now you're repeating and sharing their words and their information. And that's the part that people don't seem to understand is like when real people are spreading this information, that that's what that's the impact. That's where the weaponization comes from. Because once you start believing the meme, you have to realize that that meme was put there for a very different reason, and it was not um, a genuine reason. And and we have to do something about that. But most people don't think uh, that they are being infected by it, so they think it's just you know the, what's the word just. To agree with the sentiment, so I, you know, I'm not being influenced. I actually agree with the sentiment, and no, you are being influenced. It's a sentiment that was that was created to 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 get at, at that even, and so you just so then you quickly respond to it without thinking or doing. doing so it's all so it's almost like you know they plant that seed, and then it's like people start doing the work for the the bad actor who originally put, put that information out oh wow and then it's you know and that's why i wanted you to come on because um many people who are in the digital space and attempting to build these uh communities and to share information it's important for us to be able to understand what's going on out there and how we can be pulled into it and you know end up doing this work for them so can you talk about you know why they're choosing uh specifically um Black people in our communities, uh, and what's the, I guess, the motive or the the payoff that they're looking for? So the the the, the challenge that we have with this is that um, there's there's an argument, right? So we don't we're not a monolith. We don't agree with everything, right? Um, there's certainly don't trust the government and don't trust the systems of which we're in, uh, which is valid. Uh, and then there's others who uh, believe that um, no matter which which decisions we make as Black people in this country, has never been fair to us. Um, so with that said, we have it becomes a little bit easier to kind of because we have our own stories that don't get told, right? The story about Tuskegee, the things like that. Um, when when those things are heard, we we know what our stories are. The manipulated bit. 
then it becomes a bit of a challenge for people to understand why we're being targeted in the first place. And we do have things that, that don't get told that our grandparents told us. So it lends to you an opportunity to, to kind of manipulate, um, manipulate our belief systems as well. Um, the, but the ultimate part, especially now in the moment that we're in, is that we have learned, right, as of, you know, as of, as of 2020, um, that Black people voting, like what happened Carolina, can really change an election. And so, so there's a lot of things that happen in our country where there's this um, undercurrent that says that we have no say or no impact in our politics or our government at all. And what's been happening is we've been targeted because we have say, right? We're being targeted because we have changed a couple of really remarkable elections, right? And that to me is why we're being targeted, but also why, why um, we have always been targeted is, it was always kind of uh, uh, unsaid state, right? It was un like, why, why did Jim Crow exist right? to keep white people voting? It is, it, it's laws that get put in place to keep white people in certain positions in the South. Those are the things that are quote unquote un American <laughs> understanding, but the actions, the steps that get taken, sometimes people don't connect the dots as to why those, why some of these laws or these policies are in place. Oh, and then do you feel like, um, it, it, is this being taken seriously enough? Uh, because I, I, I think I had heard you, I think it was this today, maybe in the clubhouse room, but you know, it seemed like it was all the talk, you know, maybe four years ago. And then now we're hearing stuff here and there, but, um, it's not like this has just stopped or gone away. It seems like it's become more sophisticated or, or maybe people have been more susceptible to it. What would you say about that? Yeah, yeah, I think I think what, what was happening, what has happened in the beginning when we were doing this work, nobody believed it was real, right? So when we when we spoke about it, it was like I, we're making it up. I, I got I got told that I'm I'm making my community look bad. I'm I'm, I'm making assumptions that they are not my community is not smart enough to understand the difference. Uh, there were so many things that were said to me about the data that we were okay about. This is what the data says. This is not about what I feel about my community or not. This is actually what's happening. If if there if they, these pretending to be black people. This, there's a reason for it. And as a black person who understands my culture enough, I'm probably one of the only people who can actually see, as, as well as others. Don't get me wrong, because uh, there's a couple of women, Shafika Hudson, and I'm uh, and 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 uh, a binary person by the name of I, 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 who um, who have also seen some of this, and other people have seen these accounts pretending to be. Yeah, so showing so what we're saying is it's not that, that we are sort of going for the okie to hoke if that's the case, people want to believe that. Everyone has been impacted by the disinformation. It's not us. And it's not about our education. Like, the, 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 like you're saying that we're not intelligent enough. It's not about intelligence. It's nothing to do with intelligence. This, this is about belief systems. And those are the things that were pushed up against me when I was trying to say, hey, something's going on here that we need to be paying attention to. Now that we've gotten that evidence and other, you know, we got the U.S. Uh, Senate that was a mirror image of my report that was written a year before, right? Now we have substantial organizations or uh, universities like Harvard and others who are talking about this. Now people get it. But when we were doing it, it was like not understood. Now that we know and, and now that it's out there, it's two camps happening. One is, is the camp that thinks it's just all Russia and not real people, which is the, really interesting. There's another camp that basically says this doesn't have the impact. This is not enough of an impact about it, which is one of my problems. That's the one in the middle. And then the last one is you know, everybody's the concept that everyone who's even telling facts are also sharing disinformation. Like that's the probably the worst of it. So now nobody believes anything. And that's the purpose of disinformation and part that we're not really handling very well. We are in a disinformation ecosystem. We're living and swimming in it. And most people are participating in it, either trying to counter it or literally don't believe in 
which which is sort of an apathy to any information whatsoever, even factual information. Oh, that's so interesting because it's like um, I just remember taking a class um, in college a while, like a long time ago, and uh, I remember they were talking about terrorism and then how you know it was becoming. Uh, this is before 9-11, so I'm dating myself, but, but they were saying how it was becoming, you know, less organized and you would have, you know, some individuals acting or smaller, you know, pockets of groups and people. But um, so, yeah, it sounds so. So I did hear this, um, you know, it was on the news or something, something I was watching and they said, you know, the dis some disinformation campaigns around COVID, it was started by like, you know, like a very small, like 12 people or 12 memes or something like that. And then it ends up spreading like, you know, wildfire. Um, so I guess what can we, you know, when we run across this, especially uh, people like me as being an admin of some of these groups, um, I saw, you know, some of this, like people trying to come into our groups and, you know, we'd really have to look at the profiles and, you know, they would, they do this thing where they uh, will have a black woman in some kind of political, you know, t-shirt or something, you know, about, you know, Georgia voters or Stacey Abrams or, you know, something or a mug and they'll take, um, it'll be like the profile photo of, of this supposed person. And then, you know, I started to see these patterns as well as some of the other admins. And then when, once we click through the profiles, you know, we see that it's not, you know, who they say they are. And, but, but they, it's so, like you said about the beliefs, because, you know, people will see this and then, you know, this post will have the most likes or comments and people asking where to buy the shirt and, you know, all of these things. And, you know, it would just, it happened so quickly. Um, so I guess, you know, what, I guess, what could we, what should people do? Like if they do run across um, any kind of misinformation or disinformation, what are some of the things that we should do or should not do um, when we see this just as everyday people? Yeah, I mean, and this is a question I get all the time because people feel like they can't do anything about it. And there are things you can do as an individual, right? So for, for first thing I tell people, it's like, if you see something being shared by your friends or family, you have to, those even those things you have to take into consideration that your friends or family may be infected with this information and spreading it, right? So take, you know, take a pause and look at it. If, if it's something that hits your belief system and it hits your, it hits you, it's an emotional core, it's done in that way for you to change you're immediately out doing any investigations on your own. Like you have to take the time to do a little bit more research on, on a content that's being shared to you and from your friends or family. And sometimes you need to reel some other people in. Realize something is information, you gotta let them know, like you shared this with me, this is disinformation, and here's why. So then we can try to clean up the ecosystem a little bit more. People need to know that the disinformation spreads six times more than the, um, than the, than the facts. And that's something we have to constantly worry about. So you also have to do some due diligence looking at these accounts. Um, you have to do some due diligence and seeing where the information is coming from. Sometimes you could just do some quick searches on some of the memes that come through. And if you see a pattern of the same image being shared over and over again and, and looking at the words being used you know, repeatedly, that should tell you that something else is going on. You should probably not be sharing it. And I tell people, you know, quote, you know, if you want to counter disinformation, you might want to screenshot something and then make a statement about it instead of trying to do immediate follows and, and retweets. Because what they're weaponizing is how often something is shared or how often something gets retweeted or how often some a link is being um, produced because they're looking for those links to go back to Google for Google to spread up, you know, in popularity of that disinformation content. Because you have to remember these tools, including Google, is they're only giving you or serving up to you what's most popular. That's why you could put a couple of words in and all of a sudden it's giving you a slew of solutions. I mean, I'm sorry, not solutions, but options, right? That match, you know, a couple of, a couple of the terms. And that's because either people are searching for it or they're sharing it. And so once there's a popularity piece of it, that's what the algorithms do. They keep serving it back up to you. So if you're constantly getting disinformation and you're constantly clicking on it and responding to it, they will keep serving you the disinformation. And that's the part that most people don't realize that they're doing. They think they're discovering something. And that's the other thing. If you think you're discovering something nobody else is telling you, it probably is not. 
factual, <laughs> right? It's, 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 the, it's the sense that you're discovering something that no one else knows. Those are the ones that you need to pay a little bit more extra attention to. And there may be some, you know, some, 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 some kernels of truth that's mostly based on, on disinformation that you, may, that you may need to dig a little bit deeper. And sometimes I look at conspiracies myself just to see where the kernel of truth is coming from so I can speak to it in, 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 in its reality. So here's the kernel of truth, but here's the part that's the disinformation so that you can dissect it and get people to see it differently. Um, but I do feel like the more we do it, the better, the better we can get at this because the companies are not doing it. If you see the debates that's happening between the government and some of these social media companies around the disinformation about COVID and people dying, just know that this isn't just a you and me thing. This is like a, a global state to state um, and, and government thing as well. Oh, wow. And that, and then I guess I'm wondering, so what, you know, I know oftentimes it's, you know, people will say things about free speech, you know, when it comes to social media, but, you know, is it just, is that just the thorny issue with, with the tech companies and government, or is it something, you know, deeper going on in regards to, you know, power, you know, between the government and then Silicon Valley, or just between your, you know, people, users who, you know, want to have, you know, full autonomy over, you know, their social media. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion about the free speech argument. So I want to clarify that a little bit. So thanks for asking that question. People need to go back and read what the free speech argument really is in the First Amendment. Most people don't. I like sometimes go out every once in a while and retweet the whole paragraph. It is your right to speak against your government and not be punished, period. It is not your right to speak against me in any way. So the fact that you want freedom of expression is one thing, but the truth is you still don't have that right. And you don't have the right to the consequences of, of your speech. People think they can say whatever they want and there will be no consequences. And that's what people are asking for. I get the right to express myself and, and I should not have to deal with any consequences. That's only in the context of you speaking against your government, not in the context of me and you, not in the context of you know, screaming fire in the, in, in, the, um, in the theater, right? There are certain things that are not covered, right? Anything that incites violence, not covered. Anything that is about death, that uh, leads to death, threats or threatening somebody else's life. If you were to threaten someone in public, you can be arrested for that threat. The same thing happens online. There is, but, but what we do is we say that online is different because it's virtual. And those are the lines that we're having debates about that are just inaccurate lines. Now, the other thing that I'll say that is clear about these platforms is that they have no problems allowing the free expression and free speech of those who are being violent who are inciting violence, who are racist, sexist, threatening other people. But I will tell you, there's a caveat there. For people like me and Black women who speak up about the racism or sexism, people in communities are, who are marginalized, pushing back against those threats, those are the people who are getting subjugated and being platforms while the violent people are not being touched because freedom of speech. So we are not actually looking at speech in the same way. Penalizing the concept of freedom of speech, uh, hate group. Well, if we if we if we stop, stop them, then the then the most marginalized people will be affected. It's weaponized all the time. Fact of the matter is, being harmed right now. Now we have no protections right now. You're allowing a hate speech to go on, and you're still not protecting us. So it doesn't matter. We're not even getting the protection now. And that's what people need to realize. And that's a lot of the research that we do because the amount of people who get suspended or, or reported or banned or shut down for telling the truth is what we're actually up against. More people are given space to be harmful, to, be, to, be, to incite violence, on, on, on not only these platforms, but in general. But if you defend yourself up against any of that in any form, you're considered the most violent one. You're the problem. And that's something where you've not dealt with in terms of whose who's speech is really being given opportunities and whose speech is not. And just, just, to, just to talk about that little thing that everyone keeps bringing up about the, the previous uh, occupant, <laughs> I call him Age Orange 45 you know, him being removed from the platform, he incited violence, first of all. The, the, literally right now, if you go look his, his um, Facebook post that, that was the looting starts, the shooting starts, that, that is your government, a 
actually threatening American citizens, that's still up. And that is literally completely against the First Amendment. And we are not having the conversations about what that really means in context. It is being misused and weaponized. And that's how I feel about disinformation. One of the things about the way disinformation works the way it does is because, especially in America, is because under the guise of free speech, you get to lie even to the point that someone dies from your lie. Oh, my goodness. It's uh, it's unbelievable, especially because, you know, when you when you think about, you know, how so many um people from marginalized groups have been able to gain, you know, power through social media, you know, for all kinds of things, whether it's financial or clients or it's uh, movements or politically. And just to think that, you know, we're being targeted by the bad actor, but then we're also being targeted, you know, by these uh, companies and their rules and, you know, deciding who gets to say what and who is perceived as violent and not violent. Um, it's, it's really stunning, you know, that the fact that this is, is going on and social media has been around long enough where we, you know, we should have better, uh, you know, better benchmarks and, and parameters and guardrails up and protections. Um, and one thing I did want to um, have you touch on is about the, uh, the stop the digital voter suppression. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that, um, especially um, with the people that you're, uh, with, that's in our communities and, and with the upcoming election coming up? Yeah, yeah, we, what we've done with our report, to, our second report is uh, a definition on what digital voter suppression is. And it's basically any image or documentation whatsoever that gets shared through social media that's intended to uh, interfere in someone's ability to vote. Um, and that means like uh, memes that tell you the wrong place to go, memes that um, tell you the texture vote, which is illegal and you can't texture vote, um, memes that try to manipulate people in the terms of who they will vote for. Uh, we have been desperately tracking all of these things. So our campaign, Stop Digital Vote Suppression, is, is focused on constantly tracking these. We want people to also report these types of things to us if you see them. We're collecting that information and every, you know, during every election, we're tracking the disinformation. One of those examples is the Stop to Steal campaign that we can tell you because we've tracked it, was a campaign that started as a hashtag in 2016 and turned into a domestic action that led up to January 6th. That's a disinformation campaign that was taken to an extent of, of, of violence on the Capitol. So those are the kinds of things that we focus on because to me, if, if you wanna flip a whole election, that's, uh, uh, that's voter suppression. You're trying to literally remove other people's, um, other Americans' choices about who they voted for. So we spend a lot of energy on that. We put out different reports about that. We're tracking campaigns that will impact any future elections, including 22, 2024. So we're, we're preempting as much as we can. We were able to catch the COVID one really quickly. So that's the best that we can do because we're paying attention to it, but we need to track the or origins of where these things are coming from. So we know if it's authentic or not, and we have to see where they amplify and then have to try to deal with counter narratives about what's really going on um, and making sure the right information get, gets out. Like what happened in Philadelphia during Stop the Steal was a lot of disinformation was being shared and people were showing up with videos and images. And even the, the AG, was sending out counter messages about the disinformation and people weren't even believing the AG. So those are the kinds of things that we track because it was interfering with people's ability to one, uh, drop off their ballots during that time period. Um, there were videos that were basically fabricated that poll watchers were being kept out of places that they did not belong in. Um, and that signs were being put on doors um, that, were, um, that, were, that, was, that were being said that they were, um, both the suppression signs and they weren't. Like the, these are the types of things that we have to keep tracking. And, and, the, and the Philadelphia is just one example, but we saw the Stop the Steal start in Philadelphia and saw the way it moved across the city all the way now to what we see now with Arizona with that fake audit, right? And that's all based on a disinformation campaign. And all of that is a focus on voter suppression. Um, have you ever seen the movie Inception with Leonardo DiCaprio? Yes, I did. It reminds me of that. It was just like that idea of like, you know, not just planting the seed, but getting like the person to, you know, 
believe it and take it on themselves. And then, you know, like, ugh, that's, it's so complex because, um, you know, we, you know, we're in this internet world and, and like you said, you know, things that happen virtually, you know, have different standards, you know, versus in real life, you know, people think that like, it doesn't count, you know, or something in the, in the virtual space. Um, and I just know with, uh, here in Georgia, there was an incident, uh, I think it was during the runoffs where, a TikTok video surfaced and it was a, a white woman. And I don't know if this turned out to be true or not, but, uh, but it was a white woman who came on and she was claiming that uh, she, that a bunch of black women were going to be purged from the roles. Uh, and this was like right after I think uh, president Biden was declared the winner. And then kind of right around the time, maybe right after the, the, vo the voter registration deadline for the runoffs here in Georgia. And it, it sent like everybody into this hysteria and people were tweeting it. And I just know fair fight action. They had done some trainings on disinformation and misinformation. And I think that was maybe my, my first kind of official training about it and everything. And um, so I remember I, you know, saw it and of course everyone, you know, who, who was for, you know, Warnock and Ossoff, you know, everyone was on heightened alert of just anything happening. So when we saw the TikTok video, I just know I didn't share it, but then, um, a lot, we were getting a lot of those posts into our groups. Um, and so we just, we just kind of waited. And so I think fair fight, they did uh, tweet something out later and they weren't saying that this woman was correct or incorrect, but they were saying that, you know, the information about the purging just was not true because it was, there were no purges or anything happening at that time. And then it just, the video just sort of went away and I never, it wasn't like this person came back and, you know, provided more information or retracted or, you know, anything else happened. I mean, I don't know if it was, you know, what the intention was, um, but that was kind of when I was just, you know, kind of telling myself to be, you know, more, way more vigilant, you know, than before, um, especially in running these groups, because, you know, it's so easy for them to, you know, try to impersonate. And then, and then many of us have, you know, 20 moderators and admins helping us. Uh, so, you know, if everyone's not on the same page, these people can get into the groups. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about with COVID, uh, you know, there's so much information coming out and, I guess like if, you know, people, I guess what's the best, is the, is the best way to just put out um, credible verified information and then just anything that is not in that camp, it's better to be safe than sorry and just to ignore it until you can verify it. Exactly, that's exactly what you should do, exactly. But it should not hinder you from putting out the verified information. You need to keep putting that out consistently and constantly. Um, because that's that's the only way to counter it. Because uh, right now, the, the way in which our country operates is that the more speech, the better, right? But but what what our country doesn't understand in, in the ways in which that that model works, that means if you get more bad speech, then what happens to the better speech, right? So at this point, we need to figure out how to do a better job on the amplification. Unfortunately, there's way more amplification on the bad speech and the conspiracy spirit, conspiracy theory speeches and conversations. So we have to we have to spend a little bit more time on countering it. And the other thing that happens that that we track as well is that particularly if it's black women or women trying to push um, any kind of ele electoral agendas, um, they get targeted. They get specifically targeted and attacked to get them to be quiet. And that's also the part, right? So it's like so we we have to deal with multiple sides of this. It's the targeting, i.e. getting suspended and banned, but also those are targeting us to keep us to be quiet and threatening us to be quiet. Uh, that's the way they can get the, the, the other speech, that's the good speech, to be uh, smaller and not um, to, not as um, relevant. They just try to discredit us. Like if you think about all the things that happen, um, even to Stacey, even after the fact, right? Like what happened at um, uh, New Georgia Project, they were coming up with all these ridiculous statements that they like, they were ballot harvesting. And, you know, like those are all the things to discredit the, the good work and what's really happening. So that even when they say um, they're trying to counter the disinformation, it looks like, well, they probably may be the bad guys, right? That's all a part of the tactic. So we have to be very vigilant about that. And I remember that TikTok and actually was inaccurate, but it didn't go anywhere because enough people said it was inaccurate. So that's a good example of something that you can solve a problem with very easily because other people started to realize that no.
Sorry, I think you fr you're frozen, Shireen. Yeah, you're still frozen. Um, yeah, it's still frozen on my end. Uh, let's see. I don't know if you want to come out and come back in if it doesn't uh, come back. Sorry, there's a lot going on with the, uh, you know, the hurricane and we're getting a little bit of that water. I know we had some power outages in and out in my, in my Pilates class this morning, but uh, yeah, we're, I think you're still frozen on my end. Okay, here she is. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm gonna look to real quick and see if there's any specific questions as Shireen comes back. Let's see. I apologize, I'm gonna get my camera really quickly. I'm sorry, can you hear oh, me? Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> I was I'm saying my we're... phone now because my that's the second time my computer died on me. So I apologize. <laughs> oh, no problem. We're getting a little bit of, you know, rain today in Georgia. And I, and I was in a Pilates class earlier and the, you know, the power went down and out. So I was hoping everything was going to be okay on my end. So no problem. <laughs> so I think you were saying, um, you know, just how uh, like the TikTok video from that Georgia incident um, that was, you know, uh, enough people noticed it and that it wasn't, you know, wasn't true. Um, I guess um, I also wanted to hear a little bit about uh, as far as like you're saying the, the violence against women, especially, you know, black women and women of color and, you know, different marginalized groups, women being targeted uh, mm -hmm. to, to silence us. Uh, what would you, I guess, you know, is it the same advice um, or is there anything different you would say for women who are experiencing violence over the, the internet or violence in social media? Yeah, I mean, th th this is one of the things that um, that is challenging. So we do ask, you know, when people need help, we have on our website, stoponlinevala.com, there's a place for you to go and ask some questions or get some resources for this. But this is one of the challenges I think most people face because the risks that they're facing um, on, online can be different because what does happen is that sometimes people get doxxed, which means sharing their private information. Um, they um, they basically um, are are sending them images uh, that can be harmful or threatening. Uh, those things can happen, and there are ways to handle that, whether through the, the police department or ways in which to report that. We try to work with the tech companies to kind of help with some of that on a more on a consistent basis has been definitely a struggle. I, I won't deny that we, we can, we're, we're pushing an uphill battle on that. But I will say this, the, the ultimate point is to get you to be quiet. So if we can figure out the ways in which to make you feel safe online, make you feel secure in, in your confidence of being able to still tell these truths, um, we are here to help with that. Um, I'm always worried that they're not because of this, you know, because of where, because of that type of um, targeting, that people are feel like it's not worth their voice. And the whole point is that if your voice wasn't as important as it was, they wouldn't be trying to stop it. The same way I feel about the vote, right? That we have 389 bills to stop our ability to vote. If I vote didn't matter and I vote didn't count, they would not be. We would not have 48 states doing that. So we have to figure out how to help each other in our community to feel safe and confident enough to keep moving through and take upon the leadership that's necessary to make sure that our voices are heard. And, not, and, and the ways in which we can do that is are there are tools to help you with uh, you know, your digital privacy, um, the ways in which you can um, you know, you know, make sure that there's not, uh, not private information out there that people can use against you. Um, and those are things that we can help you with, but also there's some resources on our website where you, where you can get that. My hope is, is that ultimately at least reach out that we can help in any way, but that, but, but, but to keep in your mind that the reason why the targeting is happening is because what you said, what you're saying is really important. 
Yes. No, thank you for sharing that because, you know, it can be uh, intimidating when you get attacked, you know, online, especially when, you know, people send you, you know, DMs. I ha It hasn't happened a whole lot of times, but it's, it's happened a handful of times. I know on my end, um, like I remember, I think it was during the runoffs or the, the presidential election, uh, someone's, you know, sent some, a DM and they were talking about, you know, the KKK, you know, was going to get me or something. And, and really, you know, of course it, you know, makes you kind of, you know, catch your breath for a second. But then I always take that like, oh, okay, I must be doing something right. They're trying to silence me. And, you know, I will take a screenshot and, you know, block them or follow, you know, whatever the, the social media protocols are. And, and, you know, I think maybe one time I said, you know, I will report this, you know, to the authorities um, if I need to, if, you know, please do not contact me or something. But um, yeah, so uh, I also wanted to ask um, a question from one of our viewers, Ginger. She was asking, um, how can we determine how a meme originated? Is that even possible? Or is that, is that something that we should worry about? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, that's one of the things that we we're trying to do. Like we were able to catch the August 6th news. So that's a good one. Um, we, and we, we were able to find where, where it originated. It started on Reddit. Um, and so it was easier to see and compile. Some of them start in places like that, but some of those places we can't see. Right. Like, so if it's, if it's something may originate on WhatsApp on a, which is a, an encrypted application, we may not see where it originated on that app, but we may see when, once it gets into the social media ether, the first person who posts it, the account that shares it. Um, you may not be able to see that originally, but like I said before, if you do some searches and you see it coming in different ways or, or almost the exact same language, those are things for you, to, for, for you yourself to do a little bit more due diligence about to go look. But one of the things we try to do is with, with the work that we do is to try to do the data collection of keep finding out where it starts versus where it goes. And then looking at what we see as spikes. So if you go on our website, our reports are there. Our last one that we just did on CRT is there. And you can actually see the months that we caught the spikes in the, um, the conversations about CRT, where it started, and then where it amplified. And that's literally what we do on a, a regular basis. But sometimes for others, it may be years in the making. So you don't see it until it amplifies. Um, we're trying to catch it the, uh, at least a year or so out to, 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 to see how it moves and to figure out how to stop it before it gets to amplification. Wow. I had another question from a viewer uh, named Scott. He's out in California. He said, did you have any thoughts on the California recall and the stop the steal with G GOP efforts to suppress um, no votes in the digital space? Yeah, I mean... The, the fact that there was a the fact that there was a recall to me has a lot to do with the, the disinformation that was based on um, stop the steal. So um, that has been really interesting because it just to me I watched the way that moved and how certain people were were being represented and and the way in which it didn't look like it was just a political debate or political campaign the way it normally would be. I saw way more disinformation again. Uh, and this is just one race. As a matter of fact, for the Georgia runoff, we tracked the disinformation before the runoff. We, we put out a report in December, a, roughly a month before the runoff, tracking all the campaigns that we could see. And, and to be honest, if you look at that report, we saw that much of the disinformation included the campaign walk away. We tracked from white supremacy uh, groups to, to stop the voting for, uh, for uh, Ossoff and Warnock. Um, and uh, one of those campaigns walk away was eventually removed from Facebook and Twitter, but it was after the election. So it's like knowing this stuff before the election is really important now more than ever, which is why we have our stop digital vote suppression campaign. Well, it sounds like definitely just a, a, a training that, you know, people, you know, anybody doing anything in digital space needs to be aware of, you know, just like a, an intervention for all of us, because I, it's just, like you said, it can start, you know, something small, but then it can have these effects that impacts a person's, you know, life, their vote, you know, their livelihood, um, their, their, their rights, you know, so, um, I guess uh, I don't want to, you know, take too much of your time, but can you just maybe just touch on how you got involved in this work? Um, you know, <laughs> I know you were like a pioneer. You were you were a, definitely a pioneer in the, you know, in the internet and social networks. Uh, how did was it like a 
a natural progression um, or how did you end up in this, I guess, in this place where you're, you know, as a social analyst? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I would say, yeah, I mean, there's parts of this that's just the nature of my skill sets and the way I would, I would tell people is the gift I was born with. Um, mm -hmm. There's some truth to that. You know, I started coding at 10 years old in the projects in Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that as a Black girl, even today, people still don't think I could have been doing that. And I'm showing people like, I'm not 10 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> there was a there was a digital native before <laughs> well before we were calling it that right mm -hmm. well before social media so um so yeah for me it ended up being a little bit more of a natural progression um when i um formed uh i formed i formed the first web firm in a uh, woman called web firm in 97 i then formed the organization stop on i mean sorry digital sisters which is the focus on getting women and girls of color online into tech in 1999. This is well before this was a thing, well before we were having a conversation about diversity in tech. Um, and even at that point, um, I told people that, you know, what the hardest part of my job was, it wasn't the girls. Teaching the girls to code was the easiest part of my job. It's everything else that happened from there. Like right now, when you think about all the reasons in which, um, which is why when um, I formed uh, Stop All Violence Against Women, one of the campaigns I was following at that time was the camp, like everybody knows the, about Gamergate. Like if I mention Gamergate in any form, somebody will raise their hand, right? But if I say Donglegate, they don't know what I'm talking about. And at that time, it was a campaign where a black woman was speaking up about sexism at a conference, a tech conference. And she was, um, you know, remo basically remo like, she, she was targeted and attacked in such a way uh, for, again, speaking up about the sexism in the tech industry, which still exists. The sexism, the racism, we just saw what happened to Dr. Timnit, right? We know that this is a pattern. It doesn't even, it doesn't even matter if you have, as a Black woman in the tech industry, a PhD. So what I started to see and, and the work that I was doing was that I had originally started looking at the things that were keeping the girls from going up the pipeline. Because everyone kept saying it's a, it's a pipeline problem. It's a leak in the pipeline. It's not. It's a removal. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a stoppage that's happening. So, so that stoppage is, is, is sort of what I saw as the online violence and targeting. Because the behavior that I saw online targeting Black and brown girls, to me, was the same behavior they were being faced with when they went to go work in these tech companies. And that was the signal for me that there needs, there needs to be more conversations here about what's happening here. Because what I saw at that point, if I could code and teach myself to code at 10, that ain't the problem. You can't keep telling me over these decades that the numbers of us is still 3%. And that's about our skill sets. I can promise you it's not. Because I've, again, the easiest part of my job was teaching the girls to code. So there's something else going on. And, and that was what I, when I started paying attention to the ways in which they were being targeted, even at, on the job when quote unquote diversity is being a conversation, those people who are trying to push the diversity envelope are being attacked even at work. And then some of that is spilling over. Much of my targeted attack in 2016 were coming from people who were working inside the tech companies. And that's a reality that we don't want to face. So that's why some of this that's happening about this free speech stuff for some and others who are not who are not able to get it, it's because the sentiment, even of the content moderation process, how many times did Facebook have to change their content moderation process? Why? Because in the, the origination of it, white men were protected over black children. That's built in. You're teaching the AI to do that. So black people were getting suspended and banned for just simply saying the words white people. But a white tech dude or a white police officer saying the N-word, nada. And that's an embed. So when I when so when I formed Stop All Violence Against Women, because I had already started moving digital sisters and looking at more of the policy side of it, when I when I formed Stop All Violence Against Women, I was looking for the the legal and, 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 and policy side to stop the violence that was happening. And that led into finding these accounts pretending to be black women to one discredit black women, but to in some ways 
give a lens of excuse why the violence was happening online and why nobody should do anything about it. It still happens in really subtle ways. Like if there's a debate, you'll watch that if a black woman is speaking up in terms of that debate, someone will convince all of them to block the black person. Block the black woman, she's loud. So now there's a conversation about the black woman without her there. That's happened to me millions of times. So is it really about free speech or is it about free speech for some? And those are the kinds of led me to where we are now, which is once, you, once I got to see that and then saw the 3,500 ads that came from the Russia IRA, we did something different than anyone else did. We took the data from those ads we, we dumped it and we looked at a data visualization of those. And that's how we were to, able to determine that the majority of the targeting, the majority of those ads, the majority of the posts were black identified posts. There were other groups there. However, within the web noted web that we could see, um, there, there were other groups that were, that were also being targeted but they were being targeted outside the web. They were like the native community was outside, the Chicano community was outside, but the, but the Islam, the white second amendment, all of that was all tied into black identity. So now we have a pattern. And so we started tracking the patterns from there. That's how we got here because I was able to see it from multiple tiers that lands here. Uh, it's amazing because like you're saying the it's built into the AI and then the, the when you're putting the data data the data is showing you you know the pattern and it's not you know it's not by accident you know this is by design and uh, and it's just interesting because it's again weaponizing blackness and then on the other side of it is you know black people are so influential in the social, uh, media and social networks. Um, I just know like the, the whole TikTok uh, campaign where young black kids were, you know, using TikTok to make dance, uh, these dance viral dances. And then, uh, you know, young white uh, people would uh, take the TikTok and, or, and take the dance. And, and next thing you know, they're the ones getting the endorsements for products. They're the ones getting invited onto the talk shows. And you know, reaping money and notoriety, and they would not credit the original um, creator of those of dances, like these young black kids. And so they ended up, uh, the young black people went on like a strike of sorts and said, you know, this summer, we're not going to be creating content, uh, you know, that goes viral, we're just gonna, you know, sit this one out. And um, it still seems like nothing has really been put in place, in, in, unless I just don't know, but I really haven't heard anything from you know, that TikTok has put anything no. in place. As a matter of fact, um, there, if there's a TikTok out there where a gentleman was trying to put up his, his piece on, um, and it's a great example. The, that whole example is really important because one, it talks about how the, even our creative origins are not accepted as valuable until somebody who's not black is, is, is doing it, right? That, that's a, there's a whole piece there. Cause that goes into like, why would why would um, that group who would speak up about that be harassed too, right? And then nothing happened, right? Free speech, right? But all of a sudden, it's it's because we're defending. They're defending themselves against their they're protecting their their um their intellectual property. That somehow in that moment, like they don't even have the right to their own intellectual property. That's an American staple, by the way, because there's a lot of that. Um, but the other piece about the TikTok thing that that was also very clear was that uh, one, of the, one of the young brown uh, creatives was trying to show as they were trying to add, con add their content, describe their content, um, the algos was not allowing them to say black voices, black lives matter, um, anything that was pro-black, like I'm for black people. Like there was a whole bunch of that he like kept putting in. And every time he put something in, um, it would, it would refuse to let them upload it. They put in white supremacy, <laughs> um, white, um, the KKK, um, anything along whiteness, nothing stopping it. That's a built-in algo. Right, so even, even in that context, the freedom to identify as black, 
on these apps, it can be seen as problematic, right? Yeah. So um, th- like that is, that is a huge issue that we're up against. And not only the social media spaces, but just in general, because some of these organized events are being organized to harm. Like uh, we, we, did, we did a report with moveon.org where um, it, was, it was days, maybe a week before Kenosha. And if you know Kenosha, that's when the quote unquote young guy went down who's, who was on welfare. His mom dropped him off and he shot two people and killed them, right? But he's being lauded for killing people because there was a campaign called Shoot Them All that was targeting Black Lives Matter activists. Even though Black people didn't die at his hands, two white people did. But there was literally a campaign to organize for people to go shoot them. Those are the kinds of things that the the platform should be held accountable, accountable for. But the most important part of this is that when we did our report the week or so beforehand, Facebook and, and did a whole media campaign about all the all the all the groups and stuff they were taking down who were inciting violence. But people reported that event in Kenosha. It wasn't removed. Two people died. I just don't understand. I mean, it's it's clear as day, <laughs> you know, the like you know, especially like when the data pulls it and you're showing the thread that's leading right to it. Um yeah, I just, I really hope that we start to see uh, some kind of changes. Uh, I mean, I know people are starting to have some of these conversations, but it just still doesn't seem like enough. And it seems like the stakes are just getting higher and higher. Uh, you know, the more we, more, especially the more our country changes. Um, outside of, I have your, I'm going to, I think we're sharing your personal website um, on the, uh, in the links of the comments, but is there another um, website that you would um, suggest people to go to, to keep up with any of your reports or is everything through your, um, through your personal website? No, no, no. A stop on, on VAWA. Do you have that one? S-T-O-P online, V-A-W.com. Okay. That one. Um, stop digital voter suppression dot net okay those are best and then you can always follow me on twitter or any place else i'm the original digital sista d-i-g-i-t-a-l-s-i-s-t-a and believe me i got a lot to say and i will keep you up to date with, with all the things that are happening in disinformation spaces mm-hmm. um but also um i always push out our reports and so anything new that's coming from us that we find we try to put out Okay, wonderful. And, and I will drop all those links if they're not there already. Uh, I'll drop them in uh, the comment section. Uh, there's just so much. Uh, there's so many things that I, I want to talk to you about. And you'll definitely have to come back uh, because it's just... It, I mean, everything that you're doing and because we're in this, you know, digital war- world and the internet and social media, none of this is going away. So, But it's just the tentacles. It just, uh, it touches everything, you know? So. It does. So I know. I yeah, can- I mean, I can show you a through line at some point. We're not we're not ready to do it yet. But like the connections to QAnon, to uh, the mass mandate, anti-masking thing, to the mm-hmm. CRT and the school board stuff. There's a there's a there's a little bit of a network going on there. But yeah, it, we're, we're, that's part of what we do. We track we try to track all of that to see where it starts and to see where the networks are and then see where it moves because it's not staying in one place, right? We've mm-hmm. watched the, 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 the vaccine turn so many different disinformation channels, right? And, and it's just, it's one topic and there's so many different disinformation campaigns. And just one last question. And so this is, of course, not just happening happening in the U.S. It's it's you know happening across the world. Would you say? Um, and is is the U.S. just one of many targets, or, or not targets? Because I know it's also individuals. But it's just this just is kind of the new uh, frontier of what we have to uh, deal with if we're going to be online and and speaking out on issues and things like that. Yeah, so the unfortunate part of the story, and, and to be honest, we were probably the one of the first and main targets. Like, I mean, just like with a with a huge push to do so, particularly for our election in 2016. And that learning has been used in other states and other countries as well. Um, and so, th- so there's there's a pattern here that isn't missed. I would say that Macron won because they were able to learn from what happened to us. Okay. 
because there was a disinformation campaign, but they were able to shut it down beforehand. There, I'm, my understanding um, uh, right now, uh, based on what I was told, uh, I can't confirm or deny, but in 2020, uh, the, the, let me just say the, the cybersecurity teams of the US government was able to do a little bit more in terms of trying to stop the interference from foreign, from foreign um, influence. Mm -hmm. So much of what happened in America was Americans doing it. Mm. Oh, doing our own dirty work, you know? It's like just, we don't uh, even need, we don't even need the foreign interference. Is that yeah. And it's so true, like you were saying how, you know, it, if you already have a certain belief, you know, uh, it just, it doesn't take much, you know, to kind of just feed that. And then, you know, people are off to the races <laughs> doing, doing their own dirty work, you know, against uh, each other. Um, oh my goodness. Well, please come back. I, I can't thank you enough for coming and just being so open when I reached out to you and, you know, you were just like, okay, yeah, let's get on the schedule. And you came um, so quick to come, you know, on our show and everything. Uh, but I'm going to share again, share all the links so you can uh, keep up with Shireen and her work and keep up with all the these disinformation and misinformation campaigns that are already happening and coming down the pipeline. And also just encourage uh, those people who are in the digital space who like to digitally organize and lead and have your groups or participate in groups. It's really important that we share verified, credible information and, and not helping by, you know, keep spreading information that just isn't true or verified. Uh, and just really knowing that we can empower ourselves and, 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 you know, with the information so we know what we're doing um, and we're not adding more harm or causing uh, more violence or, you know, being part of that. Um, but please, yes, please uh, stay in touch. And I would love to have you, you know, come back, you know, at either later on in the year, uh, just to even check in to see, you know, what else has happened since, you know, this conversation and then what's coming up uh, for next year. That'd be great. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. I, I just think you're such a brilliant, you know, speaker and mind, and I appreciate uh, all the efforts you make, you know, to, to, you know, help us to elevate what we're doing in the online space. And again, thank you for coming and, uh, sharing your wealth of wisdom with us. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. I, I like any time, especially for my Georgians who are, who are fighting a good fight down there. We got to keep, we got to keep Georgia blue. So absolutely. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all, right, all right. Take care. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Ah, oh, that is so exciting. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the show and listening to Shireen. Uh, she is just a wealth of knowledge. Um, I, there are so many things I could have asked her about. Um, I did. I was curious about, you know, QAnon and all of that. And, you know, I've had personal experiences with people who, um, you know, fully believe in all of that now and are now part of that disinformation, misinformation campaign, but we'll definitely have to have Shireen to come back uh, and to share the work that she's um, working on now. And now I'm going to get back into just a few announcements. Uh, you know, I kind of rearranged the uh, show a little bit um, to accommodate Shireen. It takes a long time to get things going <laughs> on the front end and to share the, the, the show across all the groups. But I'm just going to go back to my shared screen. Uh, give me one second here. Still figuring all these little clicks out. You'd think Zoom would have made it a little bit easier since last year, but I guess they're doing the best that they can. Okay, so let me go over here to my PowerPoint or slides. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and just a few um, announcements because we did have the voting rights uh, rally that happens uh, this week. Um, so I wanted to go there. So I went to the Atlanta March on Voting Rights on Saturday, August 28th. It was the 58th anniversary of the March on Washington, where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his you know, uh, famous I Have a Dream speech. And so we were marching uh, because we want to send a message to uh, Congress that uh, the Senate needs to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, as well as the For the People's Act. Um, so this uh, 
uh, this past Saturday, I was in Atlanta. There was a march in Washington, D.C., plus um, a march around 20 plus cities around the country. And uh, I was so happy because I was able to meet up with Caleb Scott, who's in the middle, and uh, also meet up with uh, Reed Jones. And the three of us, we have been working together diligently in the digital space for quite some time now, um, throughout, really through 2019, um, and still and now. Uh, Caleb in the middle, he is the founder of uh, Demex Media, and I'll touch on that uh, later on. He's going to join me in a few interviews in the next coming weeks. Uh, but he is one of the uh, admins of uh, one of our sister Facebook groups um, out there that started during the runoff and is now, um, I think they have like 160,000 uh, members in that group. Um, and so that's the a Blue Georgia for a Stronger and Progressive America. So both, um, all three of us are admins in that group. And then uh, Reed Jones um, on the right uh, with the vote mask on. Uh, Reed, he started uh, uh, Stacey Abrams for president. Uh, and he is also an admin of um, some of the similar groups that we both um, help out with. So I had never met Reed before. So that was really exciting. It's been, you know, been over a year, you know, we both adore Stacey Abrams and, uh, and then as well as Caleb. Um, and so the three of us, we saw each other at the March. And so that was really nice just to, you know, connect with people offline and to get out there and let our voices be heard. So it was great, you know, representative Nakima Williams, she was a speaker, uh, B1 who's running for uh, secretary. Um, uh, of Secretary of uh, Georgia, Secretary of State of Georgia. Uh, there were uh, Ben Jealous, uh, the either president or former president of the NAACP. Uh, he was there speaking so many different people. Um, and so it was really nice. We, there was a lot of music and, and just excitement. And we, the, the march was short because of COVID, but we marched uh, from the King Center, uh, Dr. King Center past Ebenezer Baptist Church and down to the uh, the John, late John Lewis, his uh, the famous mural in the middle of Atlanta, and so it was just a real fun festive event. The weather was great, and um, yeah, I also had a few people um, in our group send in some photos, and so I just wanted to highlight uh, those people real quick. Okay, here we go. So again, on the left, Nakima Williams in the middle. Um, the young men right here um, holding up the sign statehood Pe people of DC. Um, that is Colby Gardner. He is a candidate for Lieutenant Governor uh, here in Georgia. And Colby, he shared some of his photos. Um, he trekked out to, to DC uh, for uh, the march that was happening. Um, and then uh, right below Colby is Todd O'Day. Todd is a huge uh, was a huge supporter of Beto O'Rourke, and he was part of uh, a group that would, that actually our Team Georgia group, we would um, cross paths with them. They would uh, knock on doors uh, for all the, can you know, any candidate that needed the help um, into the presidential election, and, and then they ended up supporting um, President Biden. But he, um, he made a trek to uh, D.C., and he was he reunited with some uh, some of his friends and people who supported Beto O'Rourke uh, early on when he ran for president. And then uh, up here in the right corner, we have Wilson Golden. Wilson, uh, I met Wilson in 2019 uh, when uh, we were putting together a little grassroots group to help out President Biden in South Carolina. And the two women who are on each side of Wilson are the nieces of or are the nieces of. Uh, the icon, uh, civil rights icon, Medgar Evers. So they were um, also there in attendance uh, and they were speakers uh, at the event as well. So thank you everybody for sharing your photos. If you did go to the march, please post them in, in our groups. Um, we would love to uh, you know, hear about uh, your experiences. Next, um, I just wanted to highlight. So in the meantime, we're still in hot call summer. Hot call summer is still going on. It is an effort by Fair Fight Action uh, uh, to encourage people to contact your senators and demand that they pass the For the People Act now. Um, that's the phone number. Uh, they're encouraging people to call every day as often as you can. I actually called today and spoke with the next guest uh, that we'll have next week, uh, Rick Hart, who will get into that um, a little bit later, but um, we're calling our senators, demanding that they pass this, um, this act so we can have our right to vote um, protected. 
Also, we're, we're asking that people call their uh, senators to also ask them to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. So those are two different bills. Um, the way Stacey Abrams has talked about it, that she'll, she said that, you know, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, that addresses, uh, you know, more things to come. Uh, but the For the People Act is addressing uh, the current harms that have already taken place um, across many states in regards to these voter suppression laws that were introduced at the state level this past year um, after the runoff. So it's very important that you let your voice be heard on this. You know, hopefully you'll take the numbers um, down. Um, John Lewis Voting Rights, you want to call your Senate uh, member at the number 833-465-7142. Um, that is a different number from the number you call for the um, for the People's Act. So I'll pull that up one more time. So for the for the People's Act, you want to call your senator at 888-453-3211. So this is through Fairfight, and uh, you call in, you put in your zip code, and they instantly connect you uh, to your representative. So it literally takes less than two three minutes to to make these calls. It is really not that big of a deal, but it has a huge impact because we have to keep the pressure on um, on the outside as the inside game is being played, you know, within Congress and with President Biden and Vice President Harris. All right. So again, back to the march. Um, so the march in Atlanta. This was uh, this is me on the left. This was one of the, one of the best signs that I saw out there. And a young woman was so kind to allow me to. Uh, take a photo with her sign. And, you know, we took photos together as well. The old South will fail. And that quote uh, came from Martina Davis, uh, Correa. Uh, she is the sister to Troy Davis. Uh, Troy Davis was uh, on death row for nearly uh, 22 years. Um, and there was a lot of doubt around his case. And uh, there were questions about um, whether or not he was actually innocent and uh, why, why he was on death row. And so his sister, Martina, she is a fierce, she was a fierce, she's since passed away, but she was a fierce uh, uh, international human rights as a uh, uh, leader and icon, especially with Amnesty International. And this quote came from her uh, in and around um, her, her brother being um, uh, executed. And so uh, when I was, you know, just kind of researching things for the show, I just thought it would be nice to highlight um, Martina's work because um, it was like she was there in spirit, you know, when I saw this sign and saw that, you know, the quote came from her. Um, but yeah, she, she, so she was a crusader, a crusader to stop her brother, um, Troy Davis, from his um, execution being executed. And that story gained thousands of supporters across the, the globe, including um, Pope Benedict, uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, former President uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, all of them, uh, you know, spoke up um, regarding uh regarding Troy Davis and his case. Uh, there was a 1989 murder of an off-duty uh, police officer, uh, Mark McPhail. He was rushing to the aid of a homeless man uh, who was being beaten. And I guess he was shot to, he was shot to death. And so um, Troy Davis's execution had been stayed three different times as his lawyers filed appeal and several witnesses had changed their testimony. And uh, his supporters insisted that there was too much doubt in the case for Davis to be executed. Um, but anyway, uh, his, his case fueled a debate over the reliability of eyewitness testimony. And uh, Martina Davis, she served as the chairwoman of the Steering Committee for Amnesty International um, in the US um, to work to abolish the death penalty. And she received uh, the Georgia Civil Liberties Award from the ACLU and award, awards from the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, uh, Amnesty International, when she passed away, they issued a statement saying that Martina fought to save her brother's life with courage, strength, and determination every step of the way, that she was a tenacious fighter, a graceful inspiration to activists everywhere, and a true hero of the movement for human rights. So Martina passed away in 2011. Uh, she was a former army flight nurse, and she served in the Gulf War. Um, and so that came from the savannahnow.com, uh, um, savannahnow.com website. But I, I just thought, you know, if I was going to highlight the sign and this quote from Martina, I wanted to highlight her life and the work that she did. And uh, for me, uh, one of the first organizing, um, I guess, positions or, you know, campaigns that I was ever involved with was campaign to, 
and the death penalty in Chicago in 2000 before I had started law school. And uh, at that time, Barack Obama was a state senator, and he was part of a broad coalition of um, people and groups and organizations to get a moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois, which we did. Um, the, it was a, actually a Republican governor who um, issued the moratorium. Um, so uh, another reason I brought up Martina and honor, I wanted to honor her today is because I want to remind everybody to uh, continue to support uh, Common uh, Good Atlanta, uh, Patrick Rodriguez, uh, he was one of our first guests, as well as Abigail Cook, our, the, our guests for uh, the first episode of Grassroots Voices. They came on to talk about probation and uh, parole reform and uh, Common Good Atlanta. They're always accepting donations to help educate people who are incarcerated. Uh, and then Reform Alliance, um, Abigail Cook is an advocate and artist, uh, and she uh, does advocacy work uh, uh, um, in regards to Reform Alliance. It was started by Jay-Z and Meek, Mill Meek Mills and uh, also supported by uh, Van Jones. And uh, they're asking people to join in uh, helping people to, or not people, but helping the states to change the law, specifically Georgia, which is one of the most supervised states um, in the world when it comes to probation and parole reform and see if uh, we can make some changes there. So please check out episode one of Grassroots Voices, or uh, you can click on those websites um, that'll hopefully be in the comments section and uh, support them there. All right. So next week, I'm super excited to have a special guest, Rick Hart. Rick Hart is the president of the Young Democrats of Georgia. Uh, he has been a mover and shaker, like for, you know, since I've known him and since the end of 2019, we met, uh, to go knock on some doors for Joe Biden uh, in South Carolina. This is back in the fall of 2019. And uh, Rick, he um, is doing outstanding work with the Young Democrats of Georgia. Uh, they're really ahead on so many things that are happening. Uh, Georgia, uh, young people in Georgia under the age of 35, uh, their voter turnout was higher than the national average for young people under 35. Uh, and uh, they are really not playing around there with the Young Democrats. So we want to hear um, updates, see what's going on with the with the youth vote, you know, Gen Z vote, uh, millennial votes. I don't know if there's another name, but Rick is going to uh, come on uh, next week. And I'm really excited to speak with him and hear what he's been up to and what people, what they're planning um, for the Young Dems for this year, for these local races happening, as well as what they're doing um, next year. And so even if you're not from Georgia, again, you know, there's outstanding organizers, uh, young people in Georgia. So it's great to still hear what they're doing. So if, you know, the young Dem is, Dems in your state aren't doing this, or if they are, you can uh, continue to support their efforts because this idea that young people don't vote is just not true. They're showing up more and more um, every day, which is why they're another group whose voting rights are under attack. And if you have not already, you have to get in on this community innovative text and phone program that Stacey Abrams and Fair Fight launched about two, three weeks ago. Uh, the number's down there, 404-737-1022. Uh, it, you, you know, put your information in and you, you can send messages directly to Stacy and her camp, and then you get information back from them. So it's, it's really fun because I love, you know, getting a text and it's saying that Stacy is sending me a text. So until this is really happening, I'm just going to go with it. All right. Uh, what else? If you have any comments, uh, show ideas, guest, su guest suggestions, please email me at grassrootsvoices. 999 at gmail.com. Um, I am already booked uh, throughout September and almost fully booked for October. So if you want to have someone come on before that time, please, please, please send me a message um, as soon as you can. But uh, I'm super excited uh, to have, uh, I don't even, I, I'll just give you weekly previews, um, but a lot of fantastic guests are lined up and people have been reaching out to me too. So I really appreciate that. So please send your ideas and comments there. And if you want to support the show, you know, in a financial and monetary way, you don't have to, but some people like to do that. And some people say, you know, if I was in Georgia, you know, we could, or, or if the pandemic wasn't going on, we could have coffee, tea or lunch. 
And so sometimes they, people will just, you know, Venmo me or PayPal and say, Hey, you know, go have a coffee, you know, or dinner on me or something. So this is one way, you know, grassroots supports, you know, I won't turn it down. I'll say thank you and receive. Uh, but this show takes a lot of time, work and energy. It's a labor of love. I do it because like, you know, Shereen and I were talking about, I want to get, you know, verified, credible, positive information out there to people. And I want to highlight and, and elevate people who are, are working every day to create social change um, and to, to do things on the ground um, in their own way. You know, everybody doesn't have to change something by running for president, but running for office is important. Uh, but there are things that you can just do in your everyday life. And there's a lot of people out there doing that thankless work. And I, my goal is to bring those voices on and, and bring those people on and build coalitions and connect people um, who are in alignment with similar values, especially around uh, voting rights and democracy and social justice. So if you wanna help that way, you can help out or support that way, you can Venmo or PayPal me. Otherwise, a huge way to help, like, share this episode, tag a friend in the comments, um, join our groups um, and keep fighting for voting rights. Uh, so, so again, um, Team Stacey Abrams uh, Grassroots, uh, uh, Team Georgia Blue, Stacey Abrams Fair Fight Club. Uh, let's see, I know I'm missing a few. Stacey Abrams for president and, okay, sorry. Three more. Uh, a Blue Georgia for a Stronger and Progressive America, Envoys for Humanity, Disability and Democracy, that's one of our newest groups, sister groups that we're adding uh, to the mix, and the Rural, Progressive, and Afro-Southeast Georgian Facebook group. So again, check the comments. Uh, the links are in the comments on how to get in contact with those groups. And I'll remind you um, again as we go forward with the show. And again, thank you for uh, showing up. Uh, I'm going to end uh, this episode with a video from DemX Media. Uh, promoting progressives to power. Uh, Demex Media was started by Caleb Scott. Again, Caleb was in the photo with uh, Reed and I when we were standing in front of the uh, Congressman John Lewis um, mural uh, here in Atlanta. Uh, Caleb was the man standing in the middle. But Caleb Scott, he's a creative marketing consultant and founder of Demex Media, which offers digital content that informs and educates Georgia voters about the political process and features candidates who are working to create a more fair and equitable Georgia for everyone. And so one of the people that he has interviewed and he just dropped uh, this video last week was Dante Carter, who you saw at the top of the uh, show. Uh, he's running for mayor of Sandy Springs. He is an HBCU graduate from Florida a &M University, which was also my alum. Uh, and so, uh, Dante is fantastic. He's outstanding. And we really need to support him and get good people into office. You know, you can help from anywhere uh, in the country. They're postcarding. They, of course, can use donations or volunteers, you know, phone banking, door knock, you know, people who can knock doors, et cetera. But uh, Caleb at Demex Media um, put together an interview with Dante. So if you missed my interview with Dante last week, um, check out Caleb's video. I'm going to end the show uh, with the video and then uh, I will close out, you know, the entire show after that. So thank you again for everybody who hung in there to the end and thank you for coming. Uh, we, I appreciate all the support and I appreciate everybody in the groups who shows up and asks questions and, you know, takes time to engage. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we will go ahead into Demx, Demx's video which I hope I have it queued up. Okay, here we go. What I did, so I'm um, starting. Okay. Hey, Dante. Hey, how are you? Doing? Good to be here. Um, I'm Caleb with Demex Media. We present information and educate voters about the process and about candidates to seek to see a fair and equitable Georgia. And I believe that you do. Thank you. And I definitely just want you to introduce yourself. I'm doing this promo series, Four Weeks with Four Seats, where I'm focusing on four different <laughs> cities in Georgia. And I love your vision for what you want to do for Sandy Springs. So if you just introduce yourself, and we'll be right up to you. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Dante Carter. I'm a uh, running for mayor. On November 2nd, 2021, here in the city of Sandy Springs. Uh, gosh, uh, my background, I graduated from Florida A&M University. 
I, I started working in uh, television news while I was still in school. Uh, worked as an executive producer, anchor reporter. Uh, was in the industry for over 10 years and uh, worked at uh, Level Live and CBS 46 here in Atlanta. Cool. And uh, once I uh, once I left the industry, I went over and worked over at the Fulton County DA's office, uh, youngest person to uh, lead up their PR department. And, uh, you know, my, my second year there, I, I got to the itch to, to step out and, and, and that's what I did. So I um, started my own PR firm. I worked with attorneys, civil rights attorneys, uh, attorneys that uh, fight for our voting rights and uh, just uh, working to make this more uh, equitable Georgia and, um, you know, really uh, trying to follow in, in, in the words of our forefathers and making this a more perfect union. And, you know, you make this a more perfect union by, by bringing people of diverse backgrounds to the table that are bringing um, uh, diverse ideas to the table that are, that are going to expand how we see our city government and, and the role that our city government plays in our lives. And I wanted to say, I guess, why 2021? I know that you made a decision, obviously, in yeah. probably the past few months or so to do it. Well, you know, there were last year there were there were there were a few uh, campaigns that I worked on. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was part of the communications team that, that worked to get uh, Shamila Williams elected as judge. Um, worked to get Mandisha Thomas in there. We worked to um, we fell just a tad short with uh, Judge Robowski Houston, but. Um, you know what I what I started to see is we needed we needed to get more people in office that um, that reflected um, the values of the people, and uh, you know I think it started off with me looking at um, the 21st Century Policing Initiative, where it discussed that if what you're what the laws that you're enforcing don't represent the values of the people, there's always going to be tension, and so people that always ask why is there tension? Well, it's because the values of the people aren't being represented, and that's that's what I'm that's what I'm running on. I'm, I'm running to put our values first. You know, I've, I've got a little girl. Um, I'm raising a young family. When I looked in her eyes, you know, she was kind of that that pivotal step in in, in, in waking me up in a sense, and, and not waking me up as as I was asleep, but waking me up as okay, this is bigger than just my family. This is this is um, this is about Georgia. Georgia played such a crucial role because there were so many people in this state that took responsibility of our politics that understood that my vote matters. That's when I said, you know what? It's it, it's time for me to, to step up in my role because again, this is this is bigger than me. I, I wanna not just create space for my daughter, but our children, the children that are coming up in this community. Sandy Springs is a very diverse community, you know, 40% minority. We don't have anybody in leadership right now that reflects us um, and, and reflects our values. And I think it's time for that to change. So it makes me think, Sandy Springs is changing so much yeah. that like, we need to tap into that energy and that yeah. enthusiasm, I'd say, because, you know, we got to meet them all. And, and you know, it's funny. It's because, you know, my wife, she's OBGYN here um, and uh, Sandy Springs. Can't tell you how many doors I've knocked on and somebody's like, your wife will live with my kids. And these, you know, these are people of different faiths, uh, uh, different races. But the, the thing that brings us all together is the fact that we value humanity. And that's what this is about, you know. Yeah. I often tell people diversity, <laughs> diversity and inclusion is an illusion if you're not talking about equity. And I, I think it's time for us to really start taking equitable looks at what we're doing and, and making a strong impact there. For sure. Well, I wanted to say too, what would you say you want to achieve by the end of your first term as mayor? Like whether that be climate, healthcare, criminal justice, or education? You know, I think the biggest thing that we're facing here in, in Sandy Springs, you know, because I don't think it's about, you know, necessarily what I want to achieve, but what I'm hearing from, from people that I'm knocking on doors and talking to, and the vast majority of people that I'm talking to, even in District 1, which, you know, you're not going to see the same type of apartments you're seeing um, in other parts of the city. They're talking about affordable housing and what that means. You know, there's a couple there that I spoke to, a young family that lived down in Atlanta, and they were essentially priced out. And uh, they had to sell their home because they couldn't afford to live there. Property taxes were shooting up. And now they're in San the Springs, they're asking the question of, okay, is the same thing going to happen to us here? I value that because I value young families. I value humanity. And I, I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges we're going to have right now is, is really taking a hard look at, at affordable housing, looking at our anti-displacement um, laws, looking at rezoning, coming up with a strong plan that, that's going to bring us, that's going to move the city forward and do it in a way that brings us all together. And I think right now that's what we're lacking. I was, I was listening to one of our diversity and inclusion task force meetings, and they were talking about mass transportation and housing. And one of the young ladies said, um, what is the point of us doing all this if, um, if the city council isn't, isn't even considering our recommendations? You know, 
that that impacted me because you know if we're talking about equity, if we're talking about diversity and inclusion, why aren't these voices um, being heard? I mean, it makes me think of that. I hate this quote, but like, if you're not at the tab, you're on the menu yeah. because that will be the first thing to be yeah. slashed for funds and everything. And I wanted to say, you obviously you lived here a couple of years. You told me about seven. Um, would you say it is possible to build the electorate to win? I, I, I definitely is. I, I think we, we've seen that, right? We saw that with the, um, gosh, man, we've seen that with the, um, with the runoff. We've seen that with the, um, with the presidential primary, the people are here, but we got to give them a reason to show up. And again, if we're not talking to the people, if we're talking about issues that they don't care about, they're not coming to the polls. Again, this isn't, this isn't about politics. This is about policies and it's about people. And if we don't start talking to the people, if we don't let the people know that we hear them, that we see them, that we are concerned about them, their everyday needs, what's going to happen? You know, there was an article that just came out that, that talked about how the incumbent gave um, one of the, the developers a $42 million tax break. You know, you're showing our business community that they're valued. You're showing our, our developers that they're valued. But what about the everyday people that make Sandy Springs work? You know, we've got a, we've got a huge working class here. We've got people who are showing up in the city. That that population would be much bigger if they could afford to live here because Sandy Springs population grows every day double. We got over 110,000. This city is only, it only has 110,000 residents and it doubles every day with people coming here to work. More people come into Sandy Springs to work than actually leave out. And, um, and so we talk about tra uh, transportation and why everything's so cluttered. I mean, you alleviate some of that by addressing the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is housing. And that's what, that's what people are talking about. When I'm knocking on doors, when I'm, when I'm getting out, I'm talking to people, they're very concerned about that. There's a, there's a woman that I spoke to, I mean, gosh, I mean, she's put three kids through the schools in, in Sandy Springs. And I know it's a Fulton County school district, but they've all gone to school here. And she said, I would have bought a house if I could afford to, but I can't. Yeah. So she spent that entire time. So they say, you know, the apartments, the renters, they're, they're short term and, and they're transit. No, they're not. There are people here that want a better life for folks. And, and, and I understand that because I was, I was one of those. I was, <laughs> my, my mother, when she, um, when she went through, um, through the divorce with, with my father, you know, she, she didn't want us growing up in a place where we didn't have the opportunities to get better. And yeah. so it started out with us being five people in a one bedroom apartment, you know, um, but she went back to school and even me seeing her do that is what inspired me on my path. You know, that's, that's why I was able to work full time at a news station and go to school for full time because I saw my mother do it. I saw the work ethic that she had. Yeah, for sure. And that creates the equitable Georgia that we yeah. have to see. Do you have a catchphrase for your campaign? You know, we, we've got a heavy lift here. A, a, a extremely heavy lift in Sandy Springs. We got some work to put in. Uh, but you know, one of the things that my mother would always say is, uh, what beats a failure? And we'd always say, hey, you know, uh, another try, another try, mm -hmm. another try. And, um, you know, I made it to where I am in life because I kept trying. And what I'm asking the citizens of Sandy Springs to do is to give down to a try because I believe that we can make a huge impact here in the city. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to say? You know, I just, I just want folks to know that I care. You know, I want them to know that I'm here for them, that I'm going to bat for them. And I, I know all of it's, uh, this, it, it might seem like I'm just talking, but um, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm here to fight, I'm here to win, and I'm here to make a difference. And, and we're going to make all these things happen. No, awesome. Well, okay, this is Caleb of Demex Media, Dante mm -hmm. Carter for Sandy Springs, providing progressives some power. Fantastic, fantastic. So if you would like to support Dante, please go to his website, danteformayor.com, D-O-N-T-A-Y-E-F-O-R-M-A-Y-O-R.com. Uh, we will continue to support Dante and uplift him through November 2nd, I believe is election day. Uh, and so again, if you want to donate uh, grassroots donations, three bucks, five bucks, all that helps. Or if you want to volunteer or, um, you know, recruit volunteers for Dante, check him out on his website. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate you stopping by, especially for those who hung in for the whole show. And even if you did not, you're, you're hopping in now. Thank you for coming and I will see you uh, next week on Tuesday, 
7 p.m. Eastern. I'm in, on September 7th, I believe. I'm interviewing Rick Hart with the Young Democrats. He's president of the Young Democrats, and we'll be talking about the youth vote. So see you then and call your senators. Take care.